everyone, welcome back to another week of One Room Schoolhouse. Uh, today we're actually going to be talking about our new book that's coming yeah. out. It's by you and Tim, uh, who's not with us today, but uh, it's called The American Story. And you can actually go online and pre-order it, but we want to take the next few weeks to tell you all some of the kind of amazing stories in America's past mm -hmm. that we cover in great detail in the book. It's going to be a great book. It's actually being printed right now at the printer, so probably in the next two weeks, it, if, if you get it online and order it today, you'll get one of the first copies of it ever. But this year, 2020 is also the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrims landing at Plymouth Rock. So this is a really big year in American history and the story of the first two towns of America yeah. uh, that the English founded, the first two colonies, are actually one of the early stories that we tell in the new book because America is kind of the, uh, early on, it's kind of the tale of two cities, right? right? I mean, the, the Pilgrims, 400 years, big celebration, actually 300 year celebration the federal government came out with a coin. So this is actually uh, legitimate currency, and it's the Pilgrims on the 300th anniversary. So here's the 400, but they are not the first group here. The first group here were those that came back in 1606 and 7, and that's the Jamestown colony. And so you have the Jamestown colony who arrived first, the Pilgrim colony who arrived second. In Jamestown, that's kind of in, that's in Virginia. It's in Virginia. And that's more south than the Pilgrims who come in, land in Massachusetts area. Not, not intentionally, they were going towards Virginia. The Pilgrims were trying, now if you know much about geography, you know that the distance from Virginia up to Cape Cod, Massachusetts is a long way off. The Pilgrims were trying to land at Jamestown, and the more they headed this direction, the harder the winds got, and the stronger they got, the more they turned, the stronger they got, the stronger they got. They tried their best to land in Jamestown, and God had other plans for them. And it really is the tale of two cities, and it's a tale told by their governors. Um, this is the early, early writings of the governor of Jamestown. John Smith. John Smith. And this is the, the first publication in America of the writings of Governor Bradford of Plymouth. So we really yeah. know the difference between the two by the writings of their governors. Yeah, and, and both of those books you can actually go and read in their entirety online. Google Books, archive.org, they're, they're really fascinating reads, especially Bradford and seeing the difference between the two uh, because a lot of the differences go back to kind of what inspired them to come across the ocean mm -hmm. and what they brought with them, kind of their most valuable possession what they brought with them along the way. And actually right here, we have, I'm sure we've shown you this before, uh, but it might have been a while. This is a 1599 Geneva Bible. And in fact, if you are familiar with the, the kind of paintings around the rotunda of the Capitol, one of the most famous pictures is called the Embarkation of the Pilgrims. And behind us, we actually have an engraving from the 1860s of this painting. And look here, they're all gathered around a Geneva Bible. Imagine a Geneva that. Bible. This is one that was actually brought over by a Puritan family. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating is on the inside, you can see it's got the text of the Bible, but all across in the margins, they have notes kind of explaining uh, notes from reformers like Calvin or Luther, Zwigli, guys uh, that, that had studied the Bible explaining kind of what, what the text really means because for so many, this is the first time they've been able to own yeah. a Bible personally. And so the pilgrims brought over a ton of these Bibles and spent a lot of time reading and studying the Word of God. And, you know, the Jamestown colony, they also had Bibles, but their approach to the Scriptures was a little mm -hmm. different, wasn't it? It was real different because for the Jamestown colony, they were Christians professing just like the pilgrims, but they did not study individually the Bible. The pilgrims believed every individual should have a Bible, every family should have a Bible, everyone should read and study it. And with the Jamestown colony, they were much more official state church. So you see a difference in Bible teachings like in government, because of the government of Jamestown, um, whatever the king says we're going to do, and the king has the Anglican church, so we're going to be Anglicans. And so from the start in Jamestown, church and state were united. The, the two were there because that's the way it was in England, and that's the way the king did it. And by the way, the king sent us here to this land. He gave us a charter. This is his nation. We have the right to be here. From the very beginning, you see a real difference with Jamestown. Jamestown and their form of government. It is not the form of government we have today. Now, they did have elections as early as 1619. They elected uh, people to the legislature, but they never did separate church and state the way the Bible teaches should be done. Yeah, and up in uh, Massachusetts, the Pilgrims took a totally different approach, and really it's kind of the difference between somebody being maybe 
Christian and somebody being biblical, right? Somebody who not just is Christian in name only, but takes the Bible and applies it to the practical things that they're doing daily. Because in, in uh, Plymouth, the pilgrims have two different types of elections. They have the elections for their civil government, right? We're going to elect William Bradford to be our governor this year or whoever else. And then they also kind of had their church government as a separate thing. So, mm-hmm. all right, let's get together. Let's choose who is going to be our minister. But those two institutions are going to be separate, right? The governor is not going to tell the minister what to preach and the minister isn't going to be playing the role of the governor. And so you have these separate institutions that work together, mm-hmm. but that aren't in control of one another. And so you have that liberty of conscience, which the pilgrims really came over to America to, to find and to protect that, that, those rights of religious conscience to worship so God. You see the difference in their government, but another area where you see difference is in land ownership. Because the king said, hey, everything in America is mine. My guys discovered it, so it's mine. You guys are welcome to go to Jamestown and live in my land. So when they got there, the Jamestown colonists said, Indians, don't care who you are. It's the king's land. We have it. And so the conflicts between the Jamestown colonists and Indians were very high. There was a lot of conflict, a lot of fighting. Uh, the, the Jamestown colonists would demand things from the Indians. Well, it was very different with the pilgrims when they dealt with the Indians there. They had a different, they had a biblical view, actually. Absolutely, because when they, when the pilgrims landed, they actually happened to, to come across a spot where the tribe that had been living there had actually been uh, taken out by a plague previous, and so it was an uninhabited piece of land. They landed there, and then some of the, the surrounding native tribes made contact. That's where you have the amazing story of Squanto mm-hmm. and the pilgrims, where they come together, and Squanto is really able to help these, a lot of church you know, <laughs> people who are, are, are not necessarily farmers learn how to adapt into the new world. And the pilgrims, as they expand, they, they institute a practice that is kind of new for the American continent, and it's called purchasing land. Because, right, the Indians, before you get the influence of the gospel, the influence of, of the Bible, the influence of the pilgrims, right, it's a conquest world mentality, right? You have that piece of land, well, I want that piece of land, so they're going to go to war, and whoever wins gets to keep that piece of land. And so that's how the vast majority, if not all, of land transactions happen before the colonists come in and say, you know what, we've got things that you might want and y'all have this land. Let's reach a mutually agreed upon price in order to exchange. I'll give you, you know, these blankets, these muskets, this provisions, if, if you'll give me the t- kind of deed title to that land. And so the pilgrims do this. They also enter into long-lasting peace treaties with the Native American tribes. In fact, the longest-lasting peace treaty between colonists and Native Americans were the pilgrims. It was a 50-year-long peace treaty, uh, and it was only broken because of the King's Phillips War when the Indians actually broke the peace treaty and attacked the pilgrims. And that's the longest-lasting one in that early colonial period, and it stems from the pilgrims' reliance on the Word of God in the way that they conducted business, not just within their own community, but with the community surrounding them as well. Another area where you see a big difference is when the Jamestown colonists arrived, they came out of England, and not being biblically thinking, they're more into their traditions and customs. And in England, you have classes and levels of people, and you have the commoners, and you have the laborers, and you have the king, and you have the lords and nobles, and so there are these classes. And so there was not the view of equality uh, among all individuals. They didn't have that view. And, And so that's where you find that Jamestown and the Jamestown colony is where slavery first came to be in America. Well, slavery tried to go into other areas as well, but the pilgrims didn't do the same thing the Jamestown colony did. They didn't tolerate the slavery. Absolutely. In fact, the Plymouth colony in their early law books become, I I think, documented, as far as we've documented, the first colony to have an anti-slavery law on the books. And what they say is man-stealing, and it actually comes out of the Bible, and it says that man-stealing is a capital offense, right? If you go in and, and you're robbing people, stealing them out of their land, and then selling them into slavery, that's a capital crime. And so the first time that a slave ship arrives in Plymouth, uh, they actually say, "Uh uh-uh, no, this isn't right. They go on board, they imprison the sailors, and they set the, the slaves free and actually say these 
people need to be returned back to where they came from, back to their homes. And that's in 1646, I believe. So all the way back, I mean, we're over 100 years before even the Declaration of Independence, and you see those principles of liberty, those principles of equality expressed on the American co uh, continent, unlike anywhere else in the world at that period of time. And it all goes back to the Pilgrims, reliance on the Bible versus kind of culture or what would be financially, at least in their minds, financially, you know, more beneficial. It all goes back to the Bible for the pilgrims, and that's not the case in other areas like Jamestown. In Jamestown, another big difference you see is, again, out of their culture, because they don't read the Bible in the same way. They're not into it, living it. They're Christian professing. But they come from an area where the king makes all the provision for you. The king owns all the land, Great Britain, and it's his, and he can let you use it, and you can, you can do sharecropping for him, or, but whatever you do, you're going to give to him. And so it's a very socialistic system. And so when they got to Jamestown, it was a very socialistic system. They relied on the government to provide for them. They would not go out and work. Jamestown actually had what was called the starving time where the two-thirds of the people died because they wouldn't work. Yeah. They actually got into cannibalism of eating other humans because they wouldn't work. And so John Smith records that he, he read to them out of the Bible um, the passage from 2 Thessalonians 3.10 that says, if you don't work, you don't eat. And he said, you are going to work. You're going to start producing. That worked while he was there. And then when he left, they got away from it. And the next governor came in. He, he said he actually had to take a whip to make people to work to keep from starving. So the socialistic system in Jamestown was just dominant. That's not what they had in Plymouth. And, and what's interesting is originally in Plymouth, they instituted what was called a common storehouse system, where it kind of was like that in, in a little bit. It was kind of socialistic, right? We're all going to work uh, on our own thing, but we're going to put all of the produce, all of the crops, everything into a common storehouse. And then we're going to distribute each according to their need. That was the idea. But just like in Jamestown, that stopped working very fast because, you know, oh, I'm not feeling good today. I'm sick. Well, I'm going to still draw my provisions because I still need them. But, you know, I really don't want to work. I really don't feel like yeah, it. Governor Bradford said they would feign sickness. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'm calling in sick. I feel great. Oh, my but... leg hurts. I can't <laughs> do it today. And so Bradford comes to that same realization and, and applying the biblical mandate, he says, okay, we're going to put you guys into family units, provide for your family first, and kind of institutes this idea of private property and personal responsibility, right? It's not the government's job. It's not the common storehouse's job to take care of you. It's your job to take care well, of you Well, actually, that was a Bible verse that they could point to, 1 Timothy 5, 8, that if you don't provide for your own household, exactly. you're worse than an infidel. You've denied the faith. Well, they actually read the Bible in Jamestown. <laughs> and they continued to practice it uh, long after William Bradford. And so this set kind of the course for free market capitalism. And, and in accordance with this, the colony at Plymouth became one of the most successful mm -hmm. early colonies in the American colonial period by far. I mean, the system that they instituted became the model for other colonies because of how successful they were. And it all goes back again to the foundation of the Bible because the Bible is a very practical book. And if you read it, you're going to succeed in what you're doing. Well, as you go back to Jamestown, another difference you'll see is that because they had this elitism, this class kind of stuff, you didn't educate everybody. I mean, in England, everybody didn't get an education. It was the lords, the nobles, and the higher people. And, and you common laborers down here don't need an education. But that's not a biblical concept. A biblical concept is everyone is to know. Everyone's to have knowledge. Every, again, the equality of the Bible, not the socialism, but the equality, the equal worth. You don't have classes. And so the people of Plymouth really did something different with education. That's right. And in the Plymouth and New England, Massachusetts, you get the first kind of public education laws, uh, one of which is called the Old Deluder Satan Act. And what it says is it being the chief project of that old deluder Satan to keep men from the knowledge of God's scriptures, we're going to come in and we're going to institute public schools so that everybody has at least a general understanding enough to be able to read the Bible because that's what's important. Because we can't have a free civilization, a free society without the moral influence of the Word of God kind of dictating the way that we live our life. And so in, in Plymouth, it's totally different, right? Let's teach our, our boys and girls how to read. And in fact, in the early... Did you say girls? Yes, I did. did they taught girls? I know. It's amazing, oh right? And that's, again, going against one of the kind of mainstream 
academic attacks as right. Women had no rights in early America, but that's you know, very evidently false. So the literacy rate in New England, based off of this public school system kind of founded by the pilgrims, uh, the literacy rate for women in the new world is actually higher than many places in the old world. And this is at a time, you know, in the, still in the 1600s, where you have a higher development, a higher widespread literacy rate, not just in, in the men, but also in the women. And it's all based on the idea that everybody, men, women, everybody needs to have an understanding in order to read the Bible for themselves, right? We're not going to trust the government, the state-run church to tell us what the Word of God says. We're not even going to trust necessarily without, without verifying it, our pastor to tell us exactly what it is. Let's be like the Bereans and study the Word for ourselves mm -hmm. so that we can apply it not just in our own life, but in our family and in our community as well. So totally different perspective than the Jamestown, the more Southern view. So what you see in Jamestown, Plymouth, is literally a tale of two cities. It's the difference the Bible makes, not just being a Christian people, but actually applying the Bible. And that's one of the things we cover in the American story. So the American story is the American story, but there's a lot of stories in the American story, which is what kind of makes it different from <laughs> textbooks today. So many textbooks today don't give you many stories. They don't give you any details. They yeah. give you dates, names, places. We have lots of stories. And so you see the stories of the individuals and the people involved and what it did and changed in their life. So, it is, a, it is a great opportunity to see a different view of history from what we often get today, and that's the American story. But that's something that, that we're going to be talking about from the next Absolutely. Bit. So go on to wallbuilders.com, check it out. If you want to pre-order it, go right ahead. We'd absolutely love to be able to send you one of the very first copies fresh off the presses that are on their way just about. So we'll be talking about more of the uh, stories out of the new book that's coming up. So continue to check in, and we'll see you next time on the One Room Schoolhouse. <laughs>